everyone in this pop-up video I'm going to be taking a comparative approach to illustrated versions of Treasure Island. I'm going to start with this uh, Everyman edition of Treasure Island. Uh, this was first published in 1992. The Everyman edition was was um, published sorry in 1992 but Peake's, Mervyn Peake's illustrations for this edition uh, first appeared in 1949 uh, and of course Treasure Island was first published in 1883 so a range of publication dates for you to deal with there. Uh, this is um, perhaps what we might consider a traditional uh, series of illustrations. Uh, we have black and white line drawings spread on plates throughout the book um, and we have one of uh, Peake's images on the cover of the book. So in these line drawings uh, and I will move through to the first of the images I'm going to be looking at uh, so that you have an idea of the sort of illustration I mean and I will come back to this image in a moment. Uh, so we have a series of line drawings uh, which uh, are full of visual coding, um, the sort of visual coding sorry associated with illustration. Uh, they have a, an aesthetic remit and they're not seeking to uh, stand in for reality in the way, for example, a photograph might. In, in the second edition uh, of Treasure Island I'm going to be looking at, we can see some evidence of photography used to do a rather different job. But this is not art for art's sake in Peake's edition of Treasure Island. Um, these illustrations communicate something about the verbal text. Uh, about Stevenson's novel and so in this sense they're embedded in the novel's narrative dimension. Uh, they, they become part of that story world. Uh, so we can say that in Peake's edition the illustrations are a feature of the narrative. Okay, they're drawn into the narrative. Now, Peake, Mervyn Peake is particularly interested in characterisation. Now, we see this in his own work. Um, of course, he's famous for the Gourmet Gas trilogy uh, and other works for children, such as Captain Slaughterboard Draws Anchor. We can see his particular interest in uh, perhaps... Um, an engagement with the colonial venture, which I think he senses at work in this book, uh, but he sees it sort of configured in the depiction of Stevenson's sea cook. Of course, those of you who are familiar with Treasure Island will know that Long John Silver is also known as the sea cook and that in fact it was the working title for Treasure Island that Stevenson sees Long John Silver, his sea cook, as absolutely central to the unfolding narrative of, of Treasure Island. He's absolutely one of my favourite characters in children's literature. Those of you who've worked with me before will know that. Um, and I think Peake's illustrations help to demonstrate why he might be such a significant character in the context of children's literature. Okay, so he's particularly, Peake is particularly interested in characterisation and his illustrations provide a sort of visual commentary or reading of the narrative sort of shifting, uh, changing perspective of Long John Silver as we move through the novel. Um, Peake absolutely recognises that ambivalence is central to Stevenson's uh, portrayal of Silver um, and that understanding is really evident um, in the aspects of the book he chooses, chooses to illustrate um, and, and Silver unsurprisingly looms quite large there. Uh, now 
if we put this in the context of children's literature at the time the book was written, so uh, sort of late 19th century, it's still quite remarkable at this point that a leading character, um, and, in, and indeed the, not only the leading character, but I'm, I think nearly every character comes under sort of moral submission, uh, sorry, suspicion or scrutiny by the end of the book. It is a book um, which has ethics that are sort of uh, muddy and complex. Um, they're, as I said before, of, of silver, they're marked by ambivalence. Uh, and this isn't typical of the more dichotomous approach that you see in lots of the moral tales that have held sway through the late 18th and 19th century in children's literature. That's not to say there's no disturbing of that dichotomous morality anywhere else, but the sort of tales by, for example, Maria Edgeworth, or if we want to look for an evangelical remit, uh, Mary Sherwood, uh, you'll start to see how much this is a departure um, for, for a, for, 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 from stories that were really grounded um, in that bedrock of, of morality, which invests in the idea of good and bad and, and is quite certain of, of, of where goodness might be located and that's really troubled uh, and in uh, in Treasure Island and we can see that at work in these illustrations. So the first picture um, I wanted to show you is the, the one that I held up for and oh by the way I should say that there is a PowerPoint to accompany this little video and all of the illustrations that I'm showing you today are on the PowerPoint so that you can take a closer look and hopefully zoom in on them. Um, it's easier than when I'm, I'm I'm sort of holding them next to me. Okay so this is so as we can see this is the sea cook um, it heads up part two and here we have Long John Silver presented as I think you can see visually, has quite a charming figure, almost demure. Look at the way that his eyes are looking down at um, Captain Flint uh, on his shoulder. Um, there's something almost, almost we might say coquettish about his appearance in, in terms of the, the, that downward glance. But there is something there's of the full-blown romantic um, in the way that he's dressed, Byronic, uh, um, I would say, almost. Most importantly, though, here, he's presented really as westernised and civilised. Um, he is the acceptable face. Well, we don't know it's piracy at the moment, but absolutely here we can see why Jim might be drawn in to... Uh, Long John Silver's world, that he takes the sea cook on face value when he first meets him. We can see that in Peake's illustration. Um, he takes on, and we can see this here, the traits of a gentleman. Um, the sort of gentleman that Jim is inclined to trust. He's lost his father, looking for a father figure, he leans on Silver. Um, and just as Silver is leaning on this crutch, so we might see uh, Jim leaning on Silver at the outset. And he, so he has, he takes on, I think almost knowingly, and Peak uh, no recognises this, the coded appearance of the colonial centre to gain trust and power, etc. He knows what he's doing. He uses the car the garb of the civilised in order to win their trust and to take control of the Hispaniola uh, on its outward voyage. Um, now, I can just give you a simple contrast with a much later plate to see the massive change in our perspective, but also the book's changing and slippery and uncertain perspective and stance on Long John Silver as the book goes on. So I'm going to move to a much later episode. We've been through the stockade. Uh, Jim has been doubted and suspected. 
uh, himself. And this rope here um, is, is, is Long John Silver pulling uh, Jim along behind him. But, you know, this looks like an almost different character here. See how he is, you know, he's really dehumanised and there is an othering at work here. Okay, he is no longer the acceptable face of civilization. All of those words that belong in terms of Saeed's or Orientalism to um, the demarcation of the other here. Less than human. Um, you know, we see in this image Silver's duplicity. The fact that, you know, we know by this point, Jim, that the, the episode, the episode and the apple bar barrel is long gone. When Jim overhears uh, Silver planning mutiny, he feels absolutely betrayed by the man that he trusted yet. Jim is still drawn in by Silver. Really, the implied reader is moved about all, all over the place in terms of who they might trust. Again, this is unusual in children's literature of this time. Usually by now, we're left in very little doubt as to who we might be supposed to trust. But really, it's hard to trust anyone. Everyone seems to move side according to the best advantage. Um, and Silver is the absolutely the, the best at, at, at playing these games. Um, and so I guess, and I, and I think, through Peake's illustrations, where we see this radical change, it amounts to a change in perspective from the, the novel itself, from the implied author, if you like. The illustrator uh, here plays a role in really recognising uh, the, the book's complex ideology. Uh, so there is no clear sense of blame from Stevenson. Yes, Silver is configured as a murderer, uh, but he's not the only character um, to have, you know, the taking of life kind of laid at their door. But because he's a pirate, because he is uncivilised, it's much easier to garb him in the clothes um, of the sort of the, the murderer who, who, who should be disdained. But nonetheless, Stevenson draws us into this character. Um, he survives. Jim gazes after him almost longingly, it seems, at the end of the book. Um, and I think as the, um, at the end result of this, we have to suspect the colonial project. Um, it's, it's not easy to follow. It seemed to be duplicitous itself. And this is all wrapped up in the complexity of Long John Silver. This is why I love this character. He's fascinating because he works the system. And um, Peak, you know, understands the, the, the human psychology wrapped up in Silver. Because Stevenson is fascinated by character too. Peak, as an illustrator, understands that and renders that in his illustrations. That shift from this... Um, I'll go, I'll go back to that earlier illustration so you really get a sense um, of that sort of side by side. Look at this, you know, really understanding how important the development of psychology is to this book. Um, and that Silver is somebody who uses their weaknesses against them. He recognises, you know, they might not have the strongest uh, moral spine, if you like, um, and, and uses that against them. And we see that as Silver pulls Jim along on that rope. And so we have this grotesquery here. Peak also a lover of the grotesque, um, as we see in in, in Gorman Gust. And actually many of his, he, I mean, he also, there's a huge amount of portraiture from, from Peak as well um, as a, a fine artist, but a different role here in his illustrations. The final thing I wanted to show you from Treasure Island, actually, is a departure from discussion of, of character. But I, I just want to show you this image of, this is Israel Hans. Uh, so uh, the book's coxswain falling from the rigging of the Hispaniola. And the reason I want to show you this image, again, you'll see it on the PowerPoint. I'm, go I'm going to move, um, move it out of the way just for a moment. The reason I want to show you this is that there is a, 
we've talked about this a little bit um, and you will have read about it in Nodelman about some of the differences between words and images in terms of um, how they're able to manage space and time. Now convention has it that illustrations are on the whole spatial. They are, they are able to conjure space and give us a sense of the spatial but they find it much more difficult to convey time. Um, and in order to convey time, we tend to have images in a sequence so that narrative moves on. But what I want to show you is that there are always exceptions to the rule, because I think in Peake's illustration here, we absolutely have a sense of move, movement. Look at that downward fall. We've Yes, we've caught him, Israel hands in a, in a in a, a moment of his fall, but there is a sense of where he's been, of the falling, that peak conveys through this hatching and line drawing, intense line drawing and hatching that really shows us the, the sequence of the fall. So what I would argue here is that this isn't space that stands still, we get a sense of duration, that this is a fall as well that goes on, that it seems to take forever, if you like, for him to die, his death is drawn out. Again, quite unusual in a book intended for children. But there is a fascination for that moment and the moment before and after, if you like. So we have duration at work in a single image, which is disrupts that idea um, that the illustration can't quite move through time. So I just wanted to show you that because I think it's absolutely uh, fascinating and shows you the skill of, a, of, a, of an illustrator like Peak. Okay, so that's the first edition I want to show you. The second really allows me to think about Treasure Island in terms of historiography and to make a link between this unit and the Time and History unit which is going to be coming up and I want to show you how illustration can really give us a sense of a book's history. Now this book uh, was this is a 1996 edition of, uh, of Treasure Island, published by, um, in, in a whole story series, uh, published by Viking. And there was a real trend for these books at the time. Um, the illustrations, by the way, were first, first um, produced in 1994, but the 90s there was a real um, sort of fad for classic literature published in highly illustrated editions. Now I'm going to flick through this just so that you get a sense of the huge number of illustrations. It, it, I mean it really is packed, every page full of different sorts of illustration. It's a really lavish edition of Treasure Island. It is not abridged which can be quite unusual for the heavy illustrated works of classic literature. Um, it is a full narrative wanting to take us into the historical remit of Treasure Island, okay? So I would suggest that through the illustrative weight of this edition, uh, the text itself is rendered a historical artefact. Now you are going to be talking about this um, layering of history, of time, if you like, in historical fiction, where often you get a book which is is written in one moment. Um, so you know this uh, published as as I said in 1883, uh, but set in an earlier moment. So set in the 18th century. Um, and actually, although we don't have a precise date for when the events in Treasure Island take place, the papers in the captain's trunk early on, for example, are dated 1745. So we get a sense um, of it being sort of mid 1700s so mid 18th century so you know Stevenson is writing back to a period you know kind of over sort of 100 years before he's actually writing so you get that doubleness because what you have is a world view um, which is much more typical perhaps in terms of values and ideology of the 19th century looking back to an earlier period which we often get of course in historical fiction this doubleness of, of kind of viewpoints so that you can also interrogate a historical fiction does interrogate earlier periods um, bring them to life too um, but you know sometimes the project can be revisionist I'm not arguing that all that is necessarily going on in Treasure Island 
but I want to show you how a book's illustrations can really give us a sense of that placement in history. So although uh, there is a historical remit here and illustration becomes a means of transmitting historical information, um, it's not a historical novel as such. Um, and when I and you're going to be talking about whole ra you know what we mean by historical fiction with Nikki, what I mean by that, and we can take an example from Stevenson himself. So, for example, Kidnapped, another very famous novel by Stevenson, published in 1886. That, on the other hand, is concerned with a specific series of political events around the Jacobout the Jacobout Rising, um, and the uh the Appin murder and its aftermath so it's a very specific well political moment but in, you know surrounded um by the events of the jacobite rising and the, the tensions between the scottish uh and the english so um it, it's very much uh about a historical moment in the way that Treasure Island has a historical setting in, in, in contrast, so working rather differently. Uh, so the whole story capitalises on that historical setting. Um, it provides some context for the period in which Stevenson himself is writing, but it really gives colourful details of its piratical and 18th century historical setting um, and there really are as I've said kind of copious illustrations here and different levels of illustration to show you the different aspects of this narrative that the whole story edition is interested in. Um, so we have the sort of illustrative uh, content that we've already seen from Peak. So, you know, the sort of fictionalised illustration which picks up on the narrative dimensions of the story. So here we have um, a character rendered in watercolour. Um, so again, that aesthetic narrative remit that I was talking about before. But then we have uh let's have a look then we have i can show you here we have the rendering of setting i'm going i'm looking at this page in particular so again we have the narrative moving on uh so the the the, the little piece of narrative alongside that to, a, to i'll move it in so you can see the image again it's on the powerpoint but bareheaded as we were we ran out uh, we ran out at once in the gathering evening and the frosty fog. So setting rendered again through watercolour here, but in comparison, we have a photograph of a sea chest and information underneath um, in the image captions. So image captions are really important in this book to convey historical information um, and to give a sense of authority uh, to the images surrounding the central narrative. So sea chests ranging from simple wooden cases uh, to elaborately uh, ornamented ones were used to hold sailors' pers personal belongings. Uh, we also have, uh, if I can move a little further on, we have um, embracing kind of the scientific elements of a maritime voyage. So we have ocean charts and then a little bit further on, we have navigational instruments. Again, I'm going to show you these in, in, the, 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 in the PowerPoint. And finally, uh, not just photographs, but we also have uh, sort of almost diagrams to show us um, the sail structure of uh, a ship. Um, so that we can see um, how all of the sails work. So real incredible level of details in the maritime conditions of the Hispaniola's voyage. Um, and the photographs of the museum objects bring a sort of museology to the book as well. Um, and, and this is where we move closer to the thing standing in for reality. But a real investment in 
in the thing so that there's a vitality to the object and this is where uh, Bill Brown's A Sense of Things come, comes into play where it seems to me that and and sorry ju ju just to tell you a little bit about being bill brown he's really interested in, in object theory but he argues that the things and objects that we can find at work in literature uh, have a real significance and ontology of their own that they matter that that they are in their own right that they exist for a reason um and I think the whole story in its depiction, you know, its photographs as canons, for example, really invests in the importance of those things uh, that surround the central characters. Um, I think that's one of the things that they really pull out. So here we have an investment in the world, the historical world that um, Treasure Island partakes of. In this book, we have a real investment in character. So illustrations doing two quite different jobs. I'm not arguing that one is more valid than the other, um, but it means that Treasure Island, depending on which version you read, becomes a very different proposition. OK, I'm going to leave it there. I'm sure we will come back to these discussions again, but I hope you found that comparison of the different ways that illustrations can work in a in, you know, supposedly the same narrative. I hope you found that helpful. OK, goodbye for now.